importance of marketing in a business. Yeah. It's not all about the creative product. Yes, you need a great creative product. Well done, you've ticked one box of seven. Welcome. This is Unfolding, the show where I talk to creative business minds. My name is Marco Pfann, and today we are talking to David Sheldon Hicks, the co-founder of Territory Studios in London. Now, what really impressed me in this interview was David's big vision for the creative industry and how Territory Studios plans to lead their clients into this new future. So enjoy the show. So today we are with David Sheldon Hicks from Territory Studio. David, would you mind introducing yourself to the community? Sure. Yeah. Um, so David founded, co-founded Territory Studio 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago with Nick. Um, and we had another business partner, Lee, who's, who's since gone on to do his other things. Uh, and we are motion design, visual effects, animation, digital, all sorts of different <laughs> things. Uh, well positioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could take on whatever position, you know, favors us at the time. Um, yeah, it's 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 grown and grown into uh, something that's really special to me. Um, I think we'll probably talk about a lot of that today. Mm -hmm. So when you say it's grown, like, where are you at the moment compared to, to where you've been in the past? So uh, we started off with me and my spare bedroom. Uh, in a little town uh, in the east part of the UK. Um, and it started with a project for electronic arts. Okay. Uh, a cinematic for Medal of Honor. And then that gave us the confidence for Nick to uh, move away from his day job. And we both set up properly. And we we landed on uh, setting up in Clerkenwell. And we've always been in this area now. So we're in Clerkenwell at the moment. Um, it's really it's an in, it's an interesting location because it's got a lot, lot of design heritage here. There's a lot of furniture design studios you probably saw as you're walking around, lots of architects. Um, but at the time, we were kind of one of a small handful of motion design studios that were here. There's our neighbours are We Are Seventeen, mainframes oh. just down the road. Nice. You know, it's a it's it's, it's a good community um, of other motion design studios we really respect. Um, so. Yeah, so we started off in in a place called Hatton Garden. We were we had space for about seven in that place, um, and it was myself, Nick, and Lee, plus a handful of freelancers. Within the first year, we we won some projects and contracts that I guess gave us confidence that we were doing things right. Mm -hmm. The numbers were coming through the business in the right way. We started to hire a few full timers, um, and moved to Berry Street, which is just down the road from here. Berry Street had space for about 30 people. We pushed that to the limits. We grew through that in about five years with a lot of film work, a lot of games work, and a good amount of kind of commercial brand mm -hmm. projects. Yeah. Then we landed in this building five years ago. And go on, you want to ask a question? No, I'm good. Um, so we landed here five years ago. It's five floors. The big change for us, I think, was splitting the team up over five floors okay. and kind of almost creating sub-communities on each floor. It's really when we found our confidence in visual effects and digital. That was, you know, that was a big deal to us. So we took motion graphics as the core backbone and we expanded out. We added in visual effects. We added in digital delivery. Um, and that really put rocket fuel behind our growth. And we're now just about to move into a new building. So we've got space for 75 here. We'll be moving into a space for 200. And between, between all of that, you know, we got Marty setting up San Francisco. We've recently acquired Cantina and formed Territory Group. Um, and we've set up in Munich. We're set up in Barcelona. We'll soon have news on other locations and hopefully nice. more news for, for Territory Group. So it's... So I think my kind of my excitement's gone from being on the tools, creatively directing, doing everything, yeah. to and and Nick talks about this a lot, kind of taking hats off. You know, you need to take different hats off, delegate different roles, seeing other people do those roles better than you, which is always good to see, reassuring to see. Um, and so my my role with a bit within the business is becoming more focused. Um, and also my relationship with the work and the clients and all that kind of stuff is becoming more distanced. 
but actually as you see the work improve because you're not interfering and you're letting others do a really good job and you're creating an environment where they can do really good creative. That's when, you know, it all starts to make sense. Um, and I was, and I was, this is me just like, you know, just getting to the crux of it very quickly. It surprised me how quickly I could move away from being hands-on creative, then moving away from being hands-on creative director to worrying about the company itself mm-hmm. and where the company's headed and the strategic vision for the studio and how I can get excited by that and bringing people with me to kind of be a part of that journey. That's that's where we're at now, really. You're really good. Like you don't you don't actually need me for this interview. This is amazing. <laughs> um, you talked about where you're heading. So actually, I would love to understand what's the future. What, what do you have in mind for territory? Like you, you started the group now? Yeah. So in the pandemic, just gave us some time to sit down as two co-founders and think, okay, where where's this all going? I had what what's good in our chemistry is I get excited by all the creative potential. And then Nick goes, That's a load of random thoughts. Let me help you distill that into some images okay. and content that makes sense that we can then talk to other people about. Okay. So we're, we're a great yin and yang in that respect. Um, and so we sat down. I kind of spurted out a load of stuff around where I think the world is headed and what territory's place is in that. And we know that I'm very passionate about holograms. I don't think that <laughs> it is a surprise to anyone. Um, I often talk about the moment when I saw Star Wars and the Princess Leia hologram projectors mm-hmm. and then the 3D chessboard. And that's like, okay. I want to be in a world where that's happening. That's a reality. Now, that can be augmented reality. It can be mixed reality on a phone. Mm -hmm. It can be LED volume. It can be real holograms that will come one day. You know, it can be all of those things. But what I'm interested in is a world where content is no longer frameless. And that's exciting to me because we can bring graphic design architectural, spatial design, narrative design all together. Mm -hmm. And it can sit in our environment. And that paradigm shift in the way we engage with content and media and technology, I think is going to open up so many creative opportunities. And what I want is to capitalize on that world that I think that I can see is coming. People are talking about the metaverse. Let's forget about that for a moment. But just the idea of frameless content and however that might exist and live, could be in automotive, could be, you know, in all okay. sorts of different industries. There's just this huge potential in terms of delivering entertainment, delivering digital services. You know, it's just moving away from a mobile screen, moving away from a computer screen. And I think fundamentally, the structure of a creative studio like ours will need to change. I don't think we can shy away from technology as a delivery. I think we need to fully back ourselves when it comes to innovation and R&D and technology. So that needs to be in place. We need to uh, be more heavily involved in storytelling. You know, ge- generally get around the craft of, mm-hmm. of stories. And, and then we wrap it all in UX and UI. You know, we create digital services around that, that that present it back to the world and make it immersive and and valid. So actually, you're creating a more holistic product, so, so to speak, right? It's like we just. I think we're finding that common thread. We we were finding that common thread in terms of our DNA, and then we're saying this is our north star. This is where we believe the world is headed, and we believe that we want to be uh, the world's leading studio that creates content and services for that future and would you could you pinpoint that future with one or two words is that is that frameless content it's frameless content frameless content oh, that's nice it's frameless content and that can be entertainment or it can be utility so it could be mapping you know google maps showing yeah. you the way in eye that, okay you know uh, that whole idea just excites yeah, me uh, it does and as we move towards driverless cars, you know, what is going to be the entertainment sphere within mm-hmm. driverless cars? How are people going to engage with content and software more generally? So what's, what do you see as the biggest challenge to get, to get the whole industry to there? Right? It's like, that's... So I don't need to get the whole creative industry there. I just need to firstly get my team there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then hopefully, you know, others will follow because we can't do it by ourselves. There's going to need to be a, a bigger ecosystem around that. But for me... It's the challenge of 
I came from a graphic design background. Okay. Graphic design and then making graphic design move, so motion graphics. Um, and that's wonderful because you're taking design and then telling stories with design. But that's not the full picture for this problem to solve. We also need people that are aware of spatial design because we're, if we're overlaying content and created within an environment, you need to be aware of human behavior, buildings, you know, um, it, it is kind of digital architecture in a lot of ways. It's it's that second layer. And we're, we're testing that conversation with people like Nike and automotive clients who are feeling as though they're coming close to this point now and they're building out test projects for when this, when this comes through. Mm-hmm. Um, and in those explorations, what we're seeing is we need a really kind of, even more so than we have a territory at the moment, a multi-threaded skill set. So it might be film directors coming together with architects, coming together with software developers, coming together with yes. graphic designers. Okay. And uh, we were originally, and what's lovely about all of this is we were originally inspired by the Bauhaus in terms of the, the, the thinking around creativity, which is doesn't really matter what the execution is. If you've got great creative problem solvers, mm. come at it first from that point of view and then figure out what the execution is going to be. So we've always had that uh in the back in the back end of our DNA, and I think that's what we're seeing becoming a need now, a reality now, is that it's not I'm an After Effects animator and I and I do my yeah. thing for three weeks and then I move on to the next animation. It becomes multi conversational in terms of the the creative and technology dynamic. But that also is a huge shift for you. At the moment, you are at least from the website, you are positioned as a service provider. Yes. So, yeah. <clears throat> and moving into this new Rome, that's a totally different thing. It's more innovative. It's actually more like, it's already like a consultancy to big yeah, companies, Yeah, in right? some ways, in some ways. I would say it's kind of, um, there's the potential of being an IP partner. So, mm-hmm. so you co-create new IPs with brands and mm-hmm. um, other, other people that have a requirement for this sort of work. That's exciting. So, and you already have contacts. So, is, is the market ready for that? There's is the industry projects are already happening. That's projects amazing. are happening, happening. The, the problem with Territory Studio <laughs> is we um, we sometimes suffer with the fame of some of our projects. So, if you go on the Territory website, people are, <laughs> gravitate towards the Blade Runners and the Marvel <laughs> projects, and you know, which is wonderful, and that creates a fantastic opening conversation because if you're doing the future of augmented reality and you've got Iron Man's heads up display on your website, that certainly helps the conversation when you're speaking to Toyota about, you know, the future of AR in in automotive, mm-hmm. for, as an example. True. So when I go into your website, you're clearly I mean, at least to me, you are VFX studio. Mm, and I can't no. you know well as the outside perspective, that's the outside perspective. Yeah, no, I accept that. It's but good- do you talk about like, I mean, do you actually talk about how you go deeper on this project? It seems like you're much more involved than just doing the visuals. Um, how do you do that? Like, how do you get clients to actually hire you for that? And they trust you in this earlier stage of the process, right? Like usually service providers get, they get a call when the client has an idea what they want to do and then yeah. you just execute and make it pretty yeah. How do you get to the strategy part? Um, I think it's been multi-threaded over the years. And I think if you dig a little bit deeper under the surface of some of the projects with Territory, you'll kind of understand how, how it kind of um, evolved. So, uh, you know, as I said, our first ever project was with Electronic Arts. Mm. So that means we were becoming very familiar with Game Engine 12 years ago. You know, Unity, Unreal and others, Mm -hmm. um, we had talent in-house having to deliver cinematics on Game Engine. We had teams designing, developing, and implementing interface in-game for most of the AAA console titles. So whilst we didn't shout about it, that was always there. Then when we we did on-set graphics... That's not visual effects. That is in art department, going on a film set and presenting semi-interactive graphics to an actor. So we're doing interactive experiences, what we call on rails. Mm -hmm. And there's an amount of development there. So when we said, oh God, 
gosh, we don't feel comfortable being pigeonholed as the sci-fi guys. We want to do more. How can we broaden our skill set? We immediately said, well, we're doing live graphics on a film set. Why wouldn't we do live graphics and programmatic immersive graphics for brands? Which is hence we spun out the experiential side. Then we're suddenly doing really interesting canvases. We're doing VR, AR, immersive. We've been doing that six, seven years. That's what I mean. I think the film, the film thing sometimes, sometimes creates an image of territory. It does, uh... And it's no bad thing. But we've had, you know, we're 100, 100 staff in London and however many more we are in globally, plus all the freelance side. We couldn't just be motion graphics and visual effects um, mm. with the projects that we're working on because we have to own more than just the UX and UI and the visual design. Often the conversations need to lead right through in terms of delivery. So Rick is our, you know, head of creative technology. We've got an entire um, team now that is dedicated to our pipeline and programming, our um, software integration, and and building out our own tool sets in house. So that innovation and accessing, you know, the, w- w- one of the great things is the UK has an R and D tax relief, so you can get real kind of um, significant financial support when it comes to innovation projects in, internally. Um, it's always been there, so. So it was more, it's been more a case of just letting our clients know mm-hmm. that that mm-hmm. exists. And, and for the clients, they like to know that it's going to be all handled in one place. You can go from start right. to finish and, and it can be delivered. That, that shift is also quite challenging for, for your in-house staff, right? What, like how does the transformation look like? So creative culture, yeah, I mean, creative culture is the biggest one. Okay. We 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 thought that uh, so one of the kind of the key projects for us was Ghost in the Shell. So Ghost in the Shell, we worked on all the holograms, and NPC came to us and said, "Look, we want you to design out all these assets, and then deliver all these assets to us to comp." So this was quite a while ago, um, and we thought, "Oh, that, how you know how hard can that be?" So, um, but the delivery mechanisms and the the processes for delivering final assets for visual effects is actually really involved and actually it's not very easy for just an out and out motion graphics team to deliver that Mm -hmm. if you're just working out of after effects and cinema 4d so we thought oh you know we'll just bolt in some visual effects compositors and other people what we realized over time was that there's a technology solution to it which is building integration between nuke maya houdini and then cinema 4d and after effects there's that. There's a color pipeline workflow, which is always very tricky. Um, but there's a cultural one. There's a massive cultural one because what the teams expect within visual effects is very different to what the teams expect in motion design. Okay. And actually, I think the biggest barrier to entry in terms of doing what we do is that cultural component. And then we're adding in digital and we also have a creative advertising team as well. So we've kind of got four distinct, potentially four distinct creative cultures working together. Uh, that's, that's, so you, you, you have bubbles, but they're kind of... It's a Venn diagram. It's a Venn diagram. <laughs> it's a Venn diagram. So there's times when... Three-dimensional Venn diagram. Yeah, yeah. 3D chess from Star Trek. There's... Um, there's times when visual effects is just visual effects. Okay. You know, when we're working on something like Mank with Fincher, it's all out photo real CG visual effects. When we're doing something like, so we're working on the new Ant-Man film at the moment, and there's a, um, there's a design component and there's a compositing, I don't know, not compositing on Ant-Man. We're working on a new Matthew Vaughan film, and there's a design component and there's a visual effects component. So we're compositing... And we're getting the motion design team to kind of hand over graphics, okay. holograms, computer screens to that team. There's a real kind of crossover on those projects. In the same way that we're doing a lot of um, Metaverse Web3 work with Nike at the moment, that's a real collaboration between our digital team and our and our motion design mm-hmm. team. So, and it's going really well. But it's taken lots of lessons and lots of time to figure that out. And we haven't figured it all out. And the people that enter into territory, I think, know that it's a work in progress. And they're often happy to invest themselves in (laughs) discovering how to make this new chemistry 
work. Mm -hmm. Some people are really excited by that discovery right. around new creative teams. And others, I think, feel like they will be excited by it. But then when presented with the reality of it, they find it a bit too messy because it is still being built. We are we are laying down the train track as we're driving yes, the train along. Yeah. Well, that's exhilarating, isn't it? Isn't <laughs> yeah. Fun. So what, I mean, but that's now, so you, there's still a shift to come, right? So what what kind of people are you looking for? When they when when you hire people for territory, like what is it the technical skills? Is it a mindset skill? Is it what would you look for first in a candidate? Yeah, I mean, I think you'll get different answers from different people, and obviously, I'm mostly just um, I'm recruiting at the exec level, mm -hmm. so I'm probably looking for a slightly different thing to say, creative director or visual effects supervisor, or our head of digital when it comes to the talent that they're hiring for, but generally. You're looking for people that are passionate because um, you've got to want to solve these problems. These problems aren't easy to solve, so you've got to be you've got to be really passionate about the area that we're involved in. Right. Um, and you know, it, it's not for everyone. It just isn't for everyone. It, some people just want to be creative. They don't want to consider the tech. They don't. They, you know, like innovation and an yeah. unusual delivery format that doesn't that doesn't excite people. So you need to be clear with them up front around what the challenges are going to be. I spent most of my job interviews I do, I spend half of the job interview just trying to put people off. Mm -hmm. This is We've got this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem and they all need solving. If that's exciting to you, you've come to the right place. <laughs> that's, a, that's um, nice. Yeah, Have we yeah. got problems? Do you want to solve them? That's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you need to be honest with people. So we try and be honest with, with the challenges that are up there, mm -hmm. not problems, challenges. Um, so people need to be passionate and interested. That's one. I think it's often useful to have a deep dive on a skill, mm -hmm. but then also have a generalist outlook. So you can cover a few different things. I can cover design, I can cover UX, I can cover a bit of animation. But actually, I'm really good at this thing, and I go deep on this thing. And I think that works well at Territory. That kind of... Um, and I think that's our ethos. We kind of go broad, but then we also... Our positioning really is... You know, people have always presented to me when they've when they've kind of consulted with businesses. You've either got the the specialisms and the deep focus, or you've got the generalists. And there's arguments for and both against both. And I've said, well, no, I think you can have both. Tissue. Which is it's a, it's a it's a series of specialisms. Okay. It's a bit it's the Apple model. We're going to create an iPhone, and it's going to be as deep as it can possibly go on that one that one delivery. Same with the watch, same with, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. But you kind of go really deep on each one of those specialisms. But then there are also cross, there's cross trans transfer going on there. So I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. should do Apple Watch. Um, <laughs> she heard that. I'm talking about you. <laughs> it's like go deep as, as deep as you can, but also look outside yeah. your box. Yeah, yeah, because... Because, especially in and of itself, has a has a has a weakness, um, which is, and we saw it in the pandemic. Film industry gets turned off, yeah, gets completely turned off, completely outside of our school. Doesn't matter how specialised you are in the film industry, no one's saving you right now. Mm. You're dead. And we just went, okay, all those people go over to games. Okay, all those people go over to immersive. That wasn't that wasn't a problem for mm. us. Um, I think people always talk up the upside of being a deep specialist. They don't consider when things don't go as planned. And and I think that is, um, I think it sometimes uh, needs addressing because I don't, I don't see it as the full truth. Mm -hmm. So David, um, I don't want to keep you off from your day job too long, but one more question. I think that could be interesting. What do you think, what's your message to, maybe it could be to your competitors, but also to the creative industry. What's the yeah. one thing that we all need to get better at? Uh, well, first of all, none of us should be thinking of each other as competitors. Uh, we're all in the same boat and we're, we're, we're all solving problems for other people. Um, so I think the thing for the industry is we need to come together more um, and we need to look at what's going to help move the industry move forward. So see beyond the life cycle of the business or or the requirements of a project. Like how do we overall improve the industry 
for the for the overall benefit of all the studios and individuals in the industry. Mm-hmm. So, I, so this comes from this comes from my personal experience. So, uh, my dad's from an engineering background. Doesn't particularly appreciate that I went down a creative field. We didn't speak for many years. I didn't speak to my father for many years because I chose to be creative. And I think there's always been this chip on my shoulder of I decided to choose a creative career path. And I think that is actually fairly familiar for a lot of creative people. They feel apologetic for going into this industry. And I think there is a perception that let's go, go, go and be an engineer, go and be a, a, a doctor, go and be a lawyer, you know, go and choose a proper profession to make your parents proud. And um, I think we, I think the, like the North Star for all of us should be, how do, how do we create an industry where when a child's telling their parents, I'm really into art and I love it, that they go, amazing. Okay. Well, that's going to be great for you. It's going to be all of these jobs in film and music and games. And, and people don't go, okay, I'm doing art at school. I'm going to be a game designer or I'm going to be a film director. Yeah. Or you don't think I could be really wealthy off of this and I could be really fulfilled and I could really enjoy my life. You think, oh, struggling artist, that sounds tricky. So I don't think people are joining the dots between purest art profession and all the potential vocationally in industry. And and I think there's this moment of education really supporting youth and getting it right there but I don't know if industry is joining up with education enough to help pull through pull through firstly people that aren't able to afford it as a career choice you know I I didn't come from a particularly I I think I ended up in the industry through complete naivety because I was it was a a single mum she had no idea what I was going on to do. She was like, just do whatever makes you happy. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going into. I didn't know what nepotism was. Didn't even consider it. Didn't consider that I might need family connections to get into the film industry. Didn't consider that going down art was not a way of, of making a living. That I might not get a pension. That I might not get medical care. That I might not get trained up and mentored and, and, and you know, get properly giving myself a career. So I went through blindly, fortunately, and, and have ended up where I am now. But there's a lot of people now that think, if I need to be in a creative studio, I need to go to London. I can't afford London. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, st- I was just br- brave or stupid, I don't know. But I just kind of, I ended up doing it. And um, I'm pleased that I did. But I, I want the message to be, for people coming through now, this is a good career choice. Like, I'm going to be okay. And the, the irony is, it's excellent. There's loads of work. Um, the, 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 the teams and the culture are really supportive. You know, it's, it is well paid. It's, it, and so we've got a lot of work to do to kind of change that perception from industry and students coming through. So they don't do art, English, and something else, and then kind of go down the English route or the, you know, yeah, okay. it, it needs to be, this is a good choice. So what can the industry do to help education do a better job? I think we need to be more vocal, not just think about our own needs as a studio, but just think about, okay, so for me, I'm joining up with a lot of education at the moment. Okay. I've started with UK universities, but I want to go over to Europe as well because post-Brexit, we need to do something about that image problem. Um And uh, I think it's creating a conversation. You know, literally, universities are crying out for this. Universities and colleges want to hear from industry. They want to have visiting lecturers. They want you to do portfolio um, sessions and create workshops. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a case about engaging with people. And uh, and having a, you know, and... The upside is going to be you're going to raise your profile. You're going to raise your profile with a load of talented students that can come in at junior positions and, and kind of feed the energy of the studio. I mean, our graduates come in. And you actually build the trust with the next Just generation. It's exciting. And they come to you, right? Yeah. It's like, not only yeah. like that, all for the industry, but for you as a studio also, like when you create the trust with the next generation. If we're not capturing at the moment where they, where they graduate and they're looking for the next one, they just become... Uh, They just don't see it as an option. They just think, what have I done? And they go off into other industries. 
And we're yeah. shooting ourselves in the foot by not helping them make that move. And, and it doesn't take a lot. It's not a big financial investment or even a time investment. It just takes a bit of consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are professional bodies that are trying to do th- things around this. And I, I don't want to work with the Design Council and BEMA and, and various other um, industry bodies to make this happen. But the more that studio owners get involved in that, uh, I think the the more positive it's going to be and the less uh, apologetic we're going to feel. So I think that's the first step. Then I think also at some point we need to agree professional standards. I think I think somebody needs to, maybe it could be you, somebody needs to step in and kind of say, you know, we need a minimum threshold here if it comes to the way that we engage with clients, free pitching, you know, all of those sorts of conversations. Right. Let's come together as an industry and start to mature. agree what yeah. ideal looks like and mature a little bit, you know, and we can't say that all creative industries have this problem. I look at architects and they've got this stuff sorted. So it is possible. They got this stuff sorted still. They, they've got their own problems. they got problems. But they've got different problems to us. Yeah, they solve true. some of the problems that we have. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's a more like, yeah, why do you think that is? That's a good question. Why do you think that is? Because we are so passionate and we love what we do. Architects too. They are passionate too. I, I think you're less passionate after seven years. <laughs> okay. I, I almost, I almost used to be an architect, and um, mm-hmm. I, I think the immediacy that we have in our projects, the immediate gratification—it's ah, like okay, it's not architecture. It's like you build I think something. The time frame creates forever. some distance and True. and a different mindset with the project and the relationship with the client. But I think when it comes to the immediacy of motion projects or digital projects. Right. And the ability to change it along the way, um, I think we 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 over egg, we over um, we over dial on our creative passion, right. which is something we need to tap into. But we don't protect ourselves commercially and have the right conversations with the client so that they understand the value you're adding and the ROI on that. And we don't have a mature conversation and tool set at the moment to feel confident in having those conversations. I think it's coming, and I think the new technology, some of the new technologies coming through will allow some of that. Um, but I think just a knowledge share, just to help everyone out, just solve some of these problems would be very, very useful. And it's going to be good for the studios and the agencies and the clients. Everyone's going to feel better yeah, about it. It does. It makes sense. Like you just said, oh, I do actually... A lot of people I talk to, they don't know the value of what they're doing, of the creativity, of the work they produce. They don't know the true value. That's why it's hard for them to actually sell it because they don't know other than, hey, I put in like so and so many hours. We need education around that and conversations around that. It's so important. It's so important. And um, the importance of marketing in a business. It's not all about the creative product. Yes, you need a great creative product. Well done. You've ticked one box of seven. You know, now, now what about all the other six? Because, you know, one of the things that I found was do great PR, champion the people that work in your team. Guess what? They feel really proud of the work and they work even harder for the client and, and, and advocate for the client. You know, so you can't, you, you can't say that it's just one thing that makes a, a creative business right. successful. It's, it's a whole plethora of things. My finance team making me confident around the numbers so I don't make silly investment decisions. You know, just... It just checks and balances. Yeah. Boring business, boring business stuff that we as creatives like. Oh, we don't do that. <laughs> well, we need to. We need to. Yeah, yeah. that's such. I love it. Perfect. That was a perfect promotion for my business. Actually, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but that's that's so true, right? The creatives, they they as creatives, they I used to. Well, I'm still in creative, but it's like you're so passionate about the work and you are kind of, I don't know what, what it is and why we do that, but it's like we blend out everything else. We don't want to worry about even writing invoices, right? Like, or collecting them or, or just managing clients in the end. So, right? Yeah. For, for me, my thing at school was I'm the creative one. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing really well on maths or physics or whatever it was. So my thing was I'm the creative one. So then, sorry, hit the microphone. So then to lean into that when you're older I think you kind of want to you can only do one you feel like you can only be one thing do one thing and actually it's far richer than that you know, the benefit to creativity is far richer than that David 
we are about to approach the end. You have one final message. Do I have one final message? Yeah. Uh, just more creative business owners helping each other, I think. You know, yes. I think um, it can be a very lonely place. I think you've mentioned this before in the past and others have mentioned it. I think um, we should all be here to support each other and that's not at odds with the client needs and it's not at odds with um, the staff needs. It's it's um, It goes back to that good mental health thing. Yeah. Like if you can get yourself sorted out, you'll be a good version of you for your team. It's the same as a parent. Like I need to have some time to myself <laughs> I need some time to myself. <laughs> totally understand that. I need to look after my exercise. I need to look after my mental health. And if I if I do those things, then I'm going to be fantastic for my family and for my team. Sure. Um, and I just think sometimes like that support network is really important. Mental health, have someone to talk to. Yeah. Do you have someone to talk about this about like business decisions? Like I I know, And you just said it, like, sometimes it's a really lonely place to be yeah. CEO of a company, right? Yeah. Who do you talk to? Uh, business partner. Okay. Um, but he comes at things from a slightly different angle, but he's been an amazing, like, rock for me over the years for various different things. Some other business owners. Um, there's, <laughs> there's lots of great ones in London. Um, sure. And I'm kind of spoiled for... You share with them? Yeah, like yeah. You yeah, share, yeah. yeah we connect? come together on... We try to come together on a monthly basis. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, and just moan about stuff. <laughs> but, you know, it's the British way. We just moan about stuff. Um, but then some good things come out of that, I okay. think. Just just empathy, you cool. know, with being in a similar position. Um, but then there's other, you know, there's other professional bodies that I'm starting to become more of a nice. more of a part of that I think help help with some of that. Cool. David, thanks for your time. It was amazing. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Marco Pfann and I'm looking forward to see you on the next show where I talk to creative legends or maybe even just myself. Who knows? We'll see.